Mfite, and I'm going to talk about abstractions, or more specifically about abstractions in philosophy. And let me introduce my agenda real quick. Um, I'm going to start by motivating this talk, and then I'm going to talk about one book, and then about another book. And finally, I'm going to revisit those motivations and summarize. And the initial thought that might pop into your head, depending on what you think about, is that this might be about techno-philosophy. Techno-philosophy is that branch of philosophy that deals with technology, Ray Kurzweil, um, AI ethics, self-driving cars, that kind of stuff. And that's all very interesting, but I, for the purposes of this talk, I don't care about any of that. Instead, I care about the fact that we build abstractions. No matter whether we build API servers, we render images, or maybe we write a network driver, all of these are essentially abstractions in some way or another. And philosophers have been building abstractions as well about very different things, like cognition, like self, identity, meaning, but they're abstractions nonetheless. And they have a few thousand years more experience than us, maybe more, but written down a few thousand years. And there's probably something that we can learn from them. And in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine a spotlight on, in this case, two books. And I hope that that whets your appetite to dig a little bit deeper into that yourself. And the first objection that you might have is, I'm not a philosopher. I didn't study this. And I didn't either. And English isn't my first language. But the beauty about a lot of philosophy is that it is very simple. It is not easy, but it deals with very simple things. Cognition and meaning and self and identity are all very simple things because we can all relate to them. We all have these things and we all have opinions about them. We might not be able to express them very well, but we know what they are. So that is something that I found very interesting when engaging with like very high level philosophy. And with that out of the way, I'm going to dive into the first book, um, Michel Foucault's The Order of Things. Um, and before I start talking about that book, I have to talk about the fact that it's not about abstractions at all, not even a little bit. It's about epistemes, which he describes as basically the base assumption on which a society builds knowledge without knowing that those are base assumptions. And that is super interesting, but without context, doesn't make much sense and it isn't necessary for the purposes of this talk. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk about the introduction of that book, which uh, is about order and abstraction and classifications. And he starts with a quote by uh, Jose Luis Borges, uh, which goes like this from a short story. Animals are divided into belonging to the emperor, embalmed, tame, suckling pigs, sirens, fabulous, stray dogs, included in the present classification, frenzied, innumerable, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc. having just broken the water pitcher that from a very long way off look like flies. And he goes on. And that is a very absurd way to classify things. It's obvious that this is, this is absurd. You don't classify things that way but it begs the question, why is it absurd? Why do we all know that this is not a useful classification? And I think it's not a useful classification in the same way that, whoop, that, yes, this is absurd. This is a trace back for those of you that don't know what this is. And it says, I'm calling a function retrieve token, which calls a function obtain access token, calling acquire access token, calling get access token. And both of these things are wrong in the same way. Namely, I can obtain an, acqui obtain an access token, get it, and uh, acquire it at the same time. It's all the same thing. And in the same uh, vein, an animal can both be embalmed and belong to the emperor. It can be drawn with a fine camel hair brush and from a very long way away, it can look like a fl fly. All of these can be true simultaneously. And so, in his introduction, not even 10 pages in, Michel Foucault uh, struck me with this thing. Classifications are not defined by what you call them or what you want them to be. They're defined by 
the space between other between them between the concepts within them are the concepts very finely separated or is there overlap as long as there is overlap it's not a good abstraction or not a good classification and then the question is why why am i talking about that at all and What's interesting is if you have a good classification, if you have, for instance, an access token, and there is one way to create it, and there's one way to delete it, and there's one way to update it, a good abstraction will fall out of that. A good, good API will just fall out of that. If I know where to look for things, if your user knows where to look for things, this is intuitive, and this is going to be a good API. This is just by thinking about things, you will know about your classifications. You will know what to look for and how to make an abstraction better. And as a side note, even if you think you're not classifying when you build an abstraction, when you build an API or whatever you're building, you're always moving stuff around at least. Something is happening, otherwise you're not writing anything at all. And as soon as you even move something around, its context changes, its meaning changes, and it's going to be something different. And you have to account for that. And then there's the other hand of that equation. Classification and order impose hierarchy. And as soon as we impose hierarchies to the things, we should think about what these hierarchies mean. And hierarchies have this unfortunate tendency of pretending they're a lens to see the world. Do you see that in machine learning all the time? You also see that in humans classifying each other. Humans um, are hard to rank because hierarchies are mostly good as an ontologies. But as soon as you rank humans by any one property, be it something obviously flawed like race or something that might not be as obviously flawed like height, you're imposing a hierarchy. And that is okay as long as you don't use it as uh, a lens to see the world. So that is something to be aware of. And now I want to move on to the second book, which is Robert Persick's uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is a super good book. It's um, half fiction and half philosophy. And it talks about a father and a son having a motorcycle trip together, about a life that was changed by mental illness and about quality. And he says quality is a thing that pertains to relationship. Quality is not something that exists. Quality exists between a subject and an object. If I look at a piece of art, say the Mona Lisa, I assign qualities to it. If I look at another piece of art, say something cubist, I assign different qualities to it. But the qualities do not pertain to the object of that relation because if someone else looks at them, they might assign different qualities to it. They might assign different qualities to the same thing they're seeing and they're just as valid. And that brings us to an interesting point that is weirdly postmodern, nam namely that quality is always between the observer and the observed. There is never, nothing is inherently good or bad. It is always in its place. It is always between two things. And that means that abstractions are always subjective. There's always a use case. There's always context for what you're building. And if everything is subjective, if everything is, is postmodern and relative, how do we empower users who have different sensibilities than we have? How do we empower users who have different opinions about the world? And there I want to talk about Git. Git is the ultimate leaky abstraction. And I mean that as a very good thing in this case, because Git empowers me to go into just the porcelain, which is something like commit or push, which most of you might have touched. But it also gives me uh, control over something that they call the plumbing, which is low-level functions that do very specific things. Um, I use git commit tree as an uh, example. It's, it works with git files that are deeply buried in your git directory. And you might not know what you're doing with that, but if you ever need them, 
then it's very nice that you have access to them regardless. So in summary, why do we have to think about these things? Why do I bring these things up? Thinking about abstractions, thinking about order and classifications and about philosophy will make you think about what your ideals are and what your aesthetics are and whether what you're doing is actually worth doing. And reading philosophy will inspire you. And if it doesn't do that, if it, if it just frustrates you, then it will at least build a vocabulary that helps you talk to other people because you know what you're talking about then. And there are other people who have experienced probably some of the same thoughts and you can borrow from that. And having, having a shared vocabulary helps greatly. And I have, I have something actionable here, but this is a talk about philosophy. We don't care about actionable things. Um, and then I have a commentated reading list. So if you want to read on any of the things or other things that are quite interesting, then you can go to, uh, do that. And I have commentary for that. And you can find all of that at GitHub. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.